Hi! In this video, we'll be talking about the impact of the internet. We've learned exactly how the internet works, how physically information is getting from point A to point B on a network, but in this video we'll take a step back, kind of forget about the actual inner workings, and look at how the internet has actually impacted us as humans. So quickly let's recap. The internet is a philosophy of making information and knowledge open and accessible to all. Now, this hasn't always been the case. Historically, information knowledge has been only available to a small subset of people, and the internet has revolutionized that. It is a philosophy of opening up information to everyone. Physically, the internet is a network of networks. It is a large network that connects several smaller networks of devices. And it's only able to work because all devices buy into the same protocols. The internet is built on open and agreed upon protocols. Now, as we've seen, the internet has impacted many fields, both positively and negatively. In this video, we'll dive in and look at some examples of that. So here's just a few of the ways the internet has impacted how we as humans work together and solve problems. The internet has enabled new levels of collaboration. It's very easy for people that aren't living close together to collaborate and work on the same problem. The internet has also revolutionized communication. Information can be spread instantly now, and you can find out about events minutes after they happen. The internet has also enabled crowdsourcing, so groups of people can come together to fund a project, to create something, or to create new knowledge. There's also serious questions of anonymity and censorship on the internet. How anonymous should internet users be, and how heavily should we be censoring the content on the internet? So first let's take a look at communication. Clearly, things like email, video calls, and social media have completely changed the way we communicate with each other. The ease of communication that we now have really enables people to stay informed and up-to-date. We've seen that social media can actually bring together communities to support really important causes. For example, we saw the Match for Laura campaign was able to get a lot of Twitter users to donate to the bone marrow registry, and this diversified the bone marrow registry so that more patients could find matches so they could receive bone marrow implants. Here's just a screenshot of a couple tweets that were about the Match for Laura campaign. It was getting very popular for a long time. We've also seen that the internet has enabled collaborative problem solving. We can harness the power of thousands or millions of people to all work on the same problem. For example, finding the proper folding structure for given proteins. So this is known as citizen science, getting several citizens to all work together on the same problem. In this example, we had a game, an online video game called Fold It, where players attempted to solve the folding structure of important proteins. And players produced an accurate model of an AIDS-causing virus in 10 days that had been unsolved for the past 15 years. There's also a version of this that doesn't actually involve humans, it involves just computing power. So the internet allows distributed computing. We can share the computing power needed to solve a problem across several different computers, and over the internet they share the results. So this is an example called Folding at Home, where several different devices are donating computing power rather than personal puzzle solving time. And this too has led to several breakthroughs in solving the folding structure of important proteins to help disease research. So Folding at Home harnessed the power of thousands of personal computers that were volunteering proce processing time. And this was able to compute exponentially more simulations than a single computer could. And this has, again, led to breakthroughs in understanding Alzheimer's, Huntington's, cancer, and HIV. E-commerce is a huge impact of the internet. We now have the ability to shop online. This allows us to buy directly from retailers. We can easily purchase from other people who may not have the funds to run their own physical store. And we're easily able to find the best product at the lowest price. Rather than being disadvantaged by the specific location you live in or a lack of knowledge about the product, all of this information can be found online to help you make an informed decision. But there's also potential downsides to e-commerce. Now that we have massive business businesses like Amazon, small businesses can no longer mark up the price on retail as much as they could because they just cannot compete with Amazon's prices. E-commerce has also allowed for crowdfunding. So groups of people can get together and all contribute relatively small amounts of money to fund massive projects. We see this in services like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and Tilt. The internet has also greatly increased all of our access to information. There are open databases of scientific publications, both free and subscription-based, that make it so that anyone, no matter who you are, can read scientific papers. But there's also a potential downside to having so much information available. Websites like WikiLeaks they are good because they support the transparency of information. They make it so that governments and corporations can't hide things from us. But this could be dangerous too. There's potential danger in sharing classified secrets with the entire world. Things like military secrets and classified intelligence. We also see that online learning is now available as a service because of the internet. It's happening right now. You're learning about the internet through the internet. 
So learning is becoming more and more blended. We're seeing more and more classrooms be both in person and online. So online courses are available in such a wide array of subjects. No matter what you want to learn, chances are you can learn it on the internet. And this brings benefits to both educators and learners. And of course, entertainment has been revolutionized by the internet. For example, YouTube provided the first way for people to actually go viral. This created a new form of celebrity, someone that just made videos in their room and gained millions of followers. There's also online gaming communities, which makes it so that you can have a one-on-one -on -one match with someone who lives across the world, or you can have hundreds of players playing simultaneously in one game. And of course, memes are now a thing. Except there's downsides to here too, because memes can be used to bully and harass people. For example, when the Cincinnati Zoo had to euthanize a gorilla because it was putting a child in danger, the internet hopped on this and made several memes that were, that were pretty much harassing the Cincinnati Zoo for having to euthanize a gorilla. And this really hurt the Cincinnati Zoo community. So there's really a lot of complications here. Everything that the internet has revolutionized comes with pros and cons. There are several legal and ethical concerns that arise from the internet, such as people getting access to copyrighted material, people being fully anonymous on the internet, and how much censorship should we really be enforcing on the internet. So access to copyrighted material is a huge problem on the internet. There are several peer-to-peer -peer networks that allow people to share content, and this is great. This is a way for people to share files, get information from point A to point B, but a lot of times the content being shared is not owned by the people sharing it. People are sharing copyrighted movies, works of art, uh, full software like Photoshop. It is easier than ever to distribute information and to distribute content that's really not your own. So to combat this, the US government actually passed what was called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This act pretty much made illegal sharing and receiving information that does not belong to you. If you are receiving a copyrighted work of art or a copyrighted piece of software, whatever it is, you need to be paying the creator for it. Whoever owns the copyright needs to define what needs to happen in order for you to receive that information. So it made piracy on the internet illegal and it's still very hard to enforce. And then there's the open source movement. And the open source movement is a movement to make all information and all products free for all. So a lot of people didn't really like this idea of copywriting things on the internet. They thought all information should be free and open no matter what. So the open source movement is a movement to create a lot of content, a lot of works of art, uh, pieces of useful software that are not copyrighted, that are free for everyone to use. And what's great is that these, these projects are all made collaboratively. People will work together to contribute small bits and pieces to make really full pieces of art or products. Things like Firefox, the operating system Linux, and most programming languages were all made co collaboratively by groups of people for free. And they released this to the public for free using open source. The, the source of all of these programs, the source code is available for you to manipulate. And then there's the question of anonymity on the internet. And this is a big question. How identifiable should internet users be? On one hand, we want equality on the internet. If all users are anonymous, then users won't be targeted or discriminated against. But then, if everyone's anonymous, you have the huge issue of cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is running rampant on the internet right now. If all users are anonymous, then no one is accountable for actions. And we see people doing pretty bad things on the internet because of this. And of course, there's the question of censorship. Should Google display search results that have explicit or illegal content? Should they be censoring the content that they are providing from search results? Should a government be able to filter what contents its citizens are allowed to see? In certain countries, things aren't illegal, but in other countries, they are. So at some point, are you allowed to filter the things that are illegal in your country? The idea is that the, that the internet is fully open, that nothing's being filtered or censored. But this could lead to issues if really young people are seeing illegal content on Google, or if illegal actions are happening in a certain country because of the internet. It's also important to keep in mind that while the internet is very popular and has grown exponentially since, it's, since it started, most of the world is still offline. In 2014, only 40% of the world had internet access. And this is what's known as the digital divide. And the idea here is that online access varies in different countries and different socioeconomic groups. And this can impact these groups in a negative way. If you don't have the internet, you have less access to information, you have less ability to communicate and receive information from the outside world, and you have less ability to educate yourself. And education and power goes hand in hand. So those without internet access tend to be in lower socioeconomic groups or in developing countries. And they're going to stay that way unless they get internet access. This, this divide is growing. So how do we combat this? Well, there's a couple ways. One way to combat the digital divide is to create services that don't require a very strong internet connection. So a lot of websites make what are called light versions, light sites. 
so that instead of having to download a lot of data in order to access the site, you only have to download a little bit. And this makes it so that even if you have just a very slow 56 kilobit per second internet connection on your phone, you're still able to access the site and use it fully. Another way to combat the digital divide is through projects that bring networks and infrastructure to communities that don't have internet. And these are usually provided by both governments and companies. So a government may say, well, this area doesn't have internet access, let's, let's build a fiber optic cable there, or let's, you know, let's put a satellite above there so that they can actually receive information either through radio waves or through light in the fiber optic cable. And companies like Google, for example, have projects to bring uh, the infrastructure required for the internet to places that don't have it. And of course, the motivation there is that if Google gets more people on the internet, Google gets more people using Google. But still, it's, it's good to bring the internet to places that wouldn't otherwise have it because you tend to be at a disadvantage if you don't have internet access. Another potentially negative impact of the internet is internet reliance. More and more, we're seeing that products and services rely on the internet to function. And this could be a bad thing. You don't want your car to only work if you have internet connection. What if you drive somewhere that doesn't have access to the internet? Or what if the internet goes down? You want your products, you want your life to be able to work even without the internet. We also see that more and more people are becoming addicted to the internet. Internet addiction is a huge problem uh, that people grow up with the internet not knowing another way to live and pretty soon they're addicted to it. So internet reliance is a huge problem. In general, there are several pros and cons when it comes to the internet. The internet has affected us humans, affected society, economy, and culture in many ways, both positively and negatively. So really, I want you to think about how has the internet impacted your life? How do you use the internet and what are the pros and cons there? How has it benefited you and how has it hurt you? So that's really the point of this lesson is to take a holistic view of the internet, see how it's affected us positively and negatively, and be informed on how we should be using the internet going forward.